All right, so acute principles, uh, blood, IV fluids, and shock. Um, we start to incorporate IV fluids towards the end because they're priority to shock and uh, revascularization of a patient that has an acute principle, especially with trauma and shock. But there's some things that we need to cover before we get there. And uh, more importantly, uh, we bring up the previous um, content that you've had uh, in Nursing 1, Nursing 2. All right. Um, so let's move on. So NCLEX and blood. All right. So let's talk about some, some basics. All right. So we started to lay down the foundation of blood. All right. And when we're talking about blood, blood is very, very, very tested on because there's, uh, there's a put in the correct order, right? Um, that's important because you would have to put things in its correct order as far as administration, okay? So the rule is time. It's always time. Blood is time. So the minute it jumps out of that cool, you got four hours to give it, okay? So that's important to know, is that you time is ticking the minute it comes from the thing. So you get your consent, do your assessment, you do your all your stuff before, get the IV, do all that stuff way before you get the blood. Because once you get that blood, time's ticking, and then you have to deliver it. But there are some basic things about blood that we have to kind of go over, and we said that you know, when you administer blood, it's based on not always just the numbers, right? We need to know the numbers, so hemoglobin and hematocrit, right? We need to talk about that. We said that. You have four spaces, right? Four, so the WBCs are four to 10. You add those two together, then you have 14. Double that to 18, that will be your males. Then subtract two, that's, that's uh, 12 and 16 will be your females. That's an important concept because the fact is, there's a differentiation in an acute process of maybe giving medications and sex or gender differences. I think now with the multitude, multitude of genders and how things are becoming a little more confusing, um, but you can't change your blood type. Right, so I mean, it's what you have. I mean, even if you're a female and you identify with a male, sorry, your <laughs> your H and H is still going to be H and H, right? You can't change that, so it's going to be one of those. Um, so, which means that I think that they just probably stay away from it. Seems too political for them. All right, so so um, H and H we look at, right? Then we always go down to matricrit. Matricrit should be triple, whatever that is. So if we have a twelve for a hemoglobin, and then so the hematocrit should be 36. Now there is one rule, we talked about this before, if we go to the 12 and the hemoglobin, we go down to the hematocrit, we're expected to be around 36, it could be 37, 35, that doesn't really matter. But if you see like 40, and you have a 12, okay, this patient's probably dry. Okay, and just think about it, it's blood, right? So we have, you know, hemo concentration, that's your hematocrit. It's how fast this hemo concentrates, okay? And that's an important thing to know because that's how we evaluate a person's dry or not. All right, so let's talk about some basic tenets about blood before we get into blood, and then we'll come back to it. All right. Um, all right, so uh, the first thing, um, benefit. Right versus risk. Why are we doing it? You know, is it worth the risk of the patient? And you know, that's always NCLEX will never get into that, but that's what we do in practice, right? If patient's traumatic, and you know, do we type in cross or do we just give O negative? Oh yes, oh no, right? So O negative is a universal donor. So. We weigh those things out, however, NCLEX will never do that. So um, generally, it's, it's the basic rule as we move into trauma, where 
trauma is the patient would have wanted us to do something for them, okay? Within our scope, right? Now, you know, they wouldn't want us to do a trach, you know, go pop it into their throat, you know, next thing you know, they got a trach. They wouldn't want that, right? But raising their legs, hold the bleeding, they'd want that, right? And so I didn't sign up for any trach. Oh, you learned this in, you know, on Grey's Anatomy. Pop, no, don't do that, right? So benefit versus risk. So when you're giving blood, it's under the same principle about, you know, um, what's the benefit of this? And that's where we've changed a lot. We just sling blood all the time, but now we, we kind of let them hover. And how low, you know? We said that GCS is uh, eight is intubated, right? Less than eight is intubated. And from that number, generally hemoglobin, less than eight, we start to have this decision. You know, so I think that NCLEX will give you the data, like there's a hemoglobin six, you know, and patients from, you know, has extreme blood loss. What's an anticipated order that you don't have to type it across? O negative, right? That's kind of how it is. Or the reverse, patient is uh, uh, AB blood, right? And, and then you go to the reverse. All right, so uh, but the rule is we never ever treat the monitor. So if we never treat the monitor, you just don't treat your labs, okay? That's why you always assess your labs. Because if you if you just say, oh, they got a low AK, I'm gonna transfuse them. What's the patient look like? So assessment first, right, before implementation. So never treat the monitor, always assess the patient first. What's their vitals? What's going on with them? Um, and it's also based on current policy. So policy drives a lot of blood reasons of benefit and risk. So, I mean, NCLEX won't test on that. More important is that the patient dies and um, or transfusion reaction, which we'll talk about. All right, so what's another thing, too? Well, we said that if on a low H&H, &H, we have to say two things. We have to say whether or not um, it's acute or chronic. Right, so that's an important piece because if the H and H is hemoglobin is low and the matocrit is low, we circle both and we say, "All right, well, is this an acute problem? Are they bleeding right now, or is this a chronic problem?" Some chronic problems could be um, kidney disease, anemic. Well, anemic, we say in nursing five, that doesn't mean anything to us. Why are they? Anemic? And that's where we started talking about macrocytic anemia, microcytics. Um, this is all nuts to know, right? So you don't need to know that stuff. I mean, so what? What do we? Why do we care? Well, I mean, anemia tends to be a generic statement. It just says the H and H is low. We want to know why, and so that's kind of the main principle. So we don't treat a patient just because they're anemic. We figure out why. Is it vitamin D? Is it Fib twelve, folate, iron B twelve? You know, what's the reason behind it? Are they a liver patient? You know, those type of things. Are they a renal patient, epigen, erythropoietin? So we don't get blood for those patients. So we generally will just watch them. Um, all right, what's another thing? Uh, is, um, what have to maybe five or something like that. Um, the patient, what about the patient? What's their wishes? You know, what do they think? You know, are they Jehovah Witness? Now, you need to know that, you know, I mean, because why? Um, this is um, education, right? So, I mean, the reason is, is that um, uh, they don't like blood products, right? So, so that it's against the religion, which is fine, right? So, um, so what about that patient? You know, I mean, then you have your own blood, right? So they can donate their own blood right, up to four months ahead of time, you don't need to know that. Um, their own blood, also called auto, auto log, yes, auto log is own blood. You know, so, I mean, terminology, right? I mean, so if they're taking their own blood, they're not getting somebody else's. So that's, so less chance of re reaction from auto logus. Right? Makes sense. Um, usually this tends to be bacterial in nature. 
A, B. Um, bacterial reactions. All right, um, what else we got? Two different types, right? So uh, the typing of uh, blood, right? So um, types. Now we said that, you know, um, oops, sorry. O, A, B, A, B, O, A, B, A, B. And we said that, you know, this goes like this. Okay, and that's your, that's your basic, uh, you know, administration and who can get what, you know. I mean, it gets more complex than that because we talk about, you know, positive versus negative, right? So, um, O negative, O, o no, I always say O no, O yes, right? So O negative is the universal donor. Okay, so they can give it to anybody. So think about this. This negative is the rogam, right? So which we learn in maternity or not. We definitely learn that. So um, <clears throat> an RH factor, they call it. Right? So they basically got a little dingleberry on their uh, red blood cells, right? And they um, are receptor sites, right? So, I mean, that's kind of what happens, right? Antibodies. So there's a, there's a red blood cell. And the antibodies are floating around in the blood. Antibodies are also proteins, okay? So if they see this and it's abnormal, they lysis it. They break it down, okay? And they kill it. So that's why this antibody antigen, right? So antibody is floating in the body. So antibodies floats in the body. Antigen is on the genus, right, on the actual um, cell, red blood cell. Um, all right, so O negative, you know, O no, O yes, right? And then AB, I can receive AB, any blood, right? So, it, you know, any blood, no, no, it's any blood positively, right? You can receive any blood positively. So AB positive um, is the universal recipient. Uh, all right, so moving on through it. All right, so a little quick little check-in. Any questions right now? <laughs> Why couldn't they teach this earlier? <laughs> um, yeah, I know, right? I did. I'm not really 100 percent sure. I can only be you know, responsible my my time. You know, I mean, it doesn't take that long. I mean, to figure it out. I mean, I mean, it's it's. Yeah, I'm gonna go over the blood steps, transfusion. Yep, we're just getting, we're just warming up to it, right? So, we're getting there. So yeah. Um, yeah, please. So uh, yeah, I mean, it's you know one piece at a time. I mean, we get there. You know, it's just one of those things. And then um, the big problem is, is like sometimes you, you get a familiarity with this, and then it, once again it goes back to application in the question. All right, so all right, so what else do we have to worry about? So we have the different types. So we have antibodies, antigens. Now antibodies, antigens are generally taught in A and P, right? So a lot of times um, I would get a, a A and P ticket from previous chairs at the not previous deans. They say, I could, you're not supposed to be teaching this stuff because they should know it. I'm like, do they though? So, you know, it's like, I think it's important to know it. Um, because a lot of times you forget it. It's not utilized. All right, so let's talk about the next thing. You know, badges, bands, those type of things. So here's the rule. So badges and bands, yes. But it depends on where you go. Okay, so right patient, you know, right time, all those type of things. But, you know, the badges and bands, I mean, that's scanning. That's all policy-driven, not tested on. Two RNs, that's universal. So you need two RNs to verify that it's actually happening. So that's important. It can't be an LPN. So it has to be two RNs um, to verify that right patient, right, right type, right um, time, and all that stuff. Uh, 
Now, the big thing is, is that, you know, I mean, that's policy driven on the other stuff. So don't worry about, about that. Now, they'll do that on NCLEX, not NCLEX questions, but some of these questions, Davis questions, you will, Kaplan, Lippincott, blah, 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 and we keep on going forward. But NCLEX won't test on it. All right, so uh, time is everything. So we're talking about it. We're talking um, time. And we already said that there's some time here. We said four hours, right? It needs to be given, right? So the rule is, and as we move to trauma, is 15 minutes. Something bad's gonna happen, it's gonna happen in the first 15 minutes. And we'll talk more about that when we get to administration. Um, all right, so we said four hours for the cooler. Um, 15 minutes. Now, there's some things about warming and different things that are not tested on. Um, what about vital signs? Okay. Well, the RN does the vital signs once you have started the blood. Okay? So here's the rule. UAPs. Let's talk about them and vital signs. Okay? Okay, so 15 minutes before, 15 minutes after. That's the only time the UAP should be doing uh, vital signs. That's the rule. Um, every other time, it should be the nurse. Now, that's different than practice, okay? So it's also different than questions, right? So the first question is, is that where are we on the time? Okay, so if the first problem can be 15 minutes, that uh, there could be a problem, so that first set when you when you administer, right, should be the nurse. And then you take it again 15 minutes later. Okay? And then 15. So that's 30. That's our second marker. Then hourly. Which is another 30. Then hour. Okay? Because if anything bad's gonna happen first 15 minutes. Okay. If anything acute is going to happen, that's when it happens. So we see this when we, when we move towards trauma, is that you know, rashes, anything like that. If it happened yesterday, and you come in today, it's not acute. Okay? So just because it looks bad, and you all these types of things, it's not going to kill you. Because how do you quantify it? It was like greater than 24 hours. So if anything bad, that's why the nurse needs to be in the room in the first 15 minutes. After that, nothing's gonna kill him today. And, you know, that might be a, a universal thing, but it's not, um, like as far as a practice thing, what you see in practice. And everybody's seen that, right? You know, a lot of you that were attacks on the floor and different things like that, right? You see nurses hang up blood walk out the door, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, and then they'll go back 15 minutes. No, you're supposed to stay in the room, you know? But you'll see this just happen. They just go in the room and then walk out. That's not that way it's supposed to work, right? Because you should have gloves on because bacterial and you should stay in the room for the first 15 minutes. All right, so how are we doing? Doing all right? Good recap? All asleep. Yeah. All right. <sighs> Kevin, can you just go over the times of vital signs again? Because some of us are like confused on when you start them, how many minutes between. Yeah, we're gonna do waters, and then we're gonna we we. Had, I'm just layering the beginning part of it. Okay. So I'm going to go back over this list again after we do the content, right? So, so, and that's just because of the way it works as far as, you know, I mean, memory retention and stuff like that. Because right now, it conflicts with a lot of things that you're familiar with, right? So, so you see, and then all of a sudden you start thinking to yourself, well, that's not the way I see it, or this isn't the way I've seen it. And this is, so, so the, the first blush of getting this content is like, it starts to dismantle everything that you think about 
And you're like, holy crap, this is totally different than what we've been doing. Or it's the same or vice versa. So it's hard to gauge where we are. So the first thing is, let's throw it out there <laughs> and then get into the transfusion reactions and why it's important. All right. So yeah, I'm going to cover that. I'll cover the time and everything like that in order of priority for this. And then I'll cover it again tomorrow too. So, um, all right, let's cruise on. So here we go. So, okay, let's talk about uh, blood products. All right, so uh, packed red blood cells, PRBCs, right? So that's most uh, likely. Um, uh, now, NCLEX won't give you that. They're just gonna tell you the patient's receiving blood, period. All right, and and they're going to base it on time. Okay, so that's always the priority for this in blood transfusions. It's always about time. Um, they understand that there's different policies about like this, that, and the other thing. But what we're going to talk about is what's most likely that you will see, um, and break it down. All right, so uh, you know, washed. Cryo precipitate, not important, not important, not important. Remember, this is this is my advanced uh, med search um, ICU book, right? So, I mean, that's kind of what this is about. Uh, you will ne never need to know five percent, twenty-five percent, and stuff like that. You just need to know the concepts. You, everybody here knows this. And then, um, type in cross history reactions, assess lung sounds. All right, and we'll talk about that. All right, so, so that's blood and blood products and the basics, right? So positive Rogam, uh, uh, RH factor, O negative, AB, um, and some basic things about it. So now we're gonna talk about transfusion reactions in the context of the process. So let's start with that and then we'll move into it. All right, so, all right, so like I said before, acute transact, acute, Transfusion reactions are going to happen within the first 15 minutes. And that's important because if you look over here, now when I'm doing research and I'm looking at all these transfusion reactions and I do questions and I look at this question and this question and when I write questions, you know, it's, it's, it gets very, very complicated. So I get it when you guys are studying and you're looking at it, and you're like, what the hell? This doesn't make any sense. And that one minute saying this, one minute saying that, which is problematic because then, then which one is it? So that's kind of that funnel aspect, which I talked about before. So I start to pull things apart and really start to take all the resources and then start to look at it. And once I start to do that, then I can start to, okay, well, here's, this is the concept, and this is the common theme. So that tends to be most likely as far as what's being tested on, all right? So let's kind of move through less than 15 minutes, okay? So, all right, so let's run through it. The patient's going to receive blood, all right? So prior to receiving blood, all right, well, are they Jehovah Witness, right? Is that an issue, right? Um... Uh, are they refusing blood? They have every right to refuse. Um, you know, but that wouldn't be a blood question. That would just be a higher Maslow question. Um, then what's their H&H? &H? Why are they getting the blood? Right? So are we in trauma? Are we not? You know, what's their H&H? &H? Those type of things. Okay. So, so now we know that. Okay. What's the time? What's the location? Am I in the ER? Well, ER means... I don't know. Do I know the blood type? Right? So if I couldn't do that, am I going to sit here and type it and then wait when a patient's bleeding out in front of me? No, that's oh no. Oh yeah, so negative. Okay. So then I would administer that in case it was. Right? So then we talked about A, B. And this is just concept. So whether I know that or not. So that's ER. Right? ICU, um, more about the reaction. On the floor, more about the reaction, okay? So that's one piece of the ER with blood. Whether or not you know o, o negative, AB, or citrate toxicity, okay? So blood can go right in, right? Well, the problem is the faster you go, 
the risk is circulatory overload. So patients who are at risk for CHF are at risk for circulatory overload, common sense. But if you're in the ER and you give multiple transfusions, we put citrate in it, okay? And citrate, because we have four hours of that blood once it comes up to, to administer it. Now, the questions that I've seen about this is, is that you have to calculate drip rate, okay? So that's important to know. So if you're struggling with that and you're getting those questions wrong, well, that's how they'll present it, okay, that you understand as a four-hour principle. Or based on their drip rate, you know where they are in their, like they, they say, you know, they received um, uh, 120 cc's, you know, and you would do that over four hours with 300 mLs in a bag, and then go from there. All right. Citrate, what is it? Well, citrate is an anticoagulant, okay, that we put in the bags, right? Because how does it not clot when it's sitting in a bag? Well, there's citrate in it, okay. Well, what's the problem with that? Well, they find multiple transfusions, transfusion, transfusion, transfusion. We should know what this is, which is this, right? So calcium and mag, upside down, low, citrate toxicity, okay? They have signs and symptoms of hypomagnesemia and hypocalcemia, okay? So hypocalcemia is most likely, this one's not most likely. This tends to be the most likely to be tested on because signs and symptoms, right? So they get the claw, they get the chiropractics, right? Hyperfast-like symptoms, right? So that only happens if you had multiple transfusions. You've gotten all the citrate in their body and it drops their, their uh, calcium. Just think of it this way. The treatment is give them calcium. Calcium go, 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 go. Calcium's good to go. Calcium gluconate is good for acute situations. So citrate toxicity, you give calcium gluconate. What about calcium chloride? Well, calcium chloride, chloride is caustic to the veins, where gluconate is a little bit more gentle, okay? Chloride should be generally C for central lines. That's nuts to know, right? Most important is that they become hypocalcemic with multiple transfusions. Um, okay, so that's it for the ER. There's all those reasons of what would happen in the ER, what you're looking for, and how the patient presents. So now it's most likely that all of you nurses are going to be on a floor not in the ER. Of course, people are going to go to the ER or whatever, you yeah. know, but most likely, 80% will go onto a floor. That makes most likely be intestine, which most likely you're going to get blood, right? And so that's why you need to know it. All right, so um, let's talk about it. Patient needs to get blood. We already talked about the ER. or well, what about on the floor? Well, I mean, for, you know, if we have an H and H, but where are we? So patients administering blood, well, when are we doing it? That's our first question. It's always, always that. It's always saying that. Just started? Okay, well, you just started. That's less than 15. Okay? One hour into the transfusion. That's exactly what it is. Okay? And that's how you start to figure out where we are. Okay? And that's the universal things is it's all based on time first, okay? And once you know the time, you can kind of go to where you, what you should be looking for, all right? So because time is most important, let's take the first 15 minutes first, okay? So, all right, so the patient's gonna receive the blood, all right? If I receive an order for blood, do they have an IVN, 1918 to 20? So that's done first, right? I don't send anybody to get the blood. Who can get it? UAP could get that. Um, if it's less than 15 minutes, I can have the UAP do vital signs, but I'm gonna do that first set 
once we administer. Now understand this, at the time of administration, now here's where it gets a little bit confusing on different books and when it happens. That first set, once transfusion has begun, right? So if you have transfusion starts, well, prior to that, you have vital signs, right? Because it hasn't started yet. Well, here's a gray area in your books and Saunders and Davis and Lippincott and all these things, right? Is this vital signs on the starting gate. So what I find is, is that policy, not policy, um, delegation is if it's less than 15 minutes, a UAP can do it. Nothing's happened to that patient, right? I mean, they're getting the blood. Well, why are they getting it? Well, it doesn't say why they're getting it. Okay, so think about that. If they're saying you're going to give blood, it doesn't say why they're getting the blood. So it can be any reason why they're getting the blood. All right, so if they haven't started the transfusion, can a UAP do vital signs? Is it within their scope to do vital signs? Can somebody have a H and H of eight or nine and be transfused? They could be. Get it? So, is the patient stable or are they not? It's not stable. Well, it's not about this stability because they're getting just because they're getting blood. People get blood for all these different reasons. So there's not enough data in the question to say that this is outside the scope of a UAP prior to blood transfusions. Because you would accept vital signs from a UAP. Once you start the gun, right now, nursing assessment is begun because we have started the transfusion and we're looking at the first 15 minutes of problems. So it's important for the nurse to be in the room and, and to be assessing that patient. So when we're looking at transfusion reactions, it's going to happen in the first 15 minutes. So then we, let's take one at a time as we move through it. All right. So let's take the easiest one first. All right. This will be the acute hemolytic. Now, the problem with this content is it's like the chest tube question. It's like the trach question. Those questions that you're given one after another and you're doing content, you're just going through it. In one minute you're doing this, one minute the symptoms are this, one minute the symptoms are this. And you start to get gray about, wait a second, which one is it? What do I do now? One minute, one minute I'm doing this, in the next minute I'm doing this. Stop. When are you doing the blood? What time frame are we in? Now answer the question. Okay, so let's start with hemolytic first. Okay, exactly what it means, hemolytic. First, ABO incompatibility. You gave O positive. Okay, and the patient was B positive or B negative or whatever. It's incompatible. So you gave this, this blood. Now, they'll never give you, oh, the patient received this blood and they got this blood, what do you think it is? It's never like that. It's always based on symptomology, right? So, so you gave a uh, O positive, right? So they had a little dingleberry on there, right? And they were AB positive, okay? But they have antibodies out there, AB. So what happens is, is that the body sees it, this O coming in and says, wait a second, you don't belong here. So then it's us the lice. So that's hemolytic, right? And we're all good with that. Everybody can get that, right? So, so think about this concept now. So you have all this junk going through the vessels, and it gets filtered to the kidneys. So think about this. Look at this. So all these fragments are all getting stuck in the kidneys. Hence, 
lower back pain, flank pain, kidney pain, okay, hemolytic. That's all it's saying. It's saying that, you know, and that's kind of where you sometimes don't see the trees in the forest. It's exactly what it means. It means that everything's bursting and it's floating around. And then, so we start to see fevers and chills. Why? You have mass inflammation, right? Your body is in this histamine response. But look at this. You got fever and chills, fever and chills. Okay? And this is where you'll start to see, because you see over here, fevers. Okay? Which then you start to say, okay, well, that doesn't mean anything, because those are distractors. What I'm really trying to figure out is what is specific to the situation of what's going on. Okay. Well, these fragments start to all break. Okay. Well, what comes out of the cells and everything like that when things start to break, right? Potassium. Right? Doesn't mean that potassium comes out of this, but just stay with me what's going on. So all these fragments start to go through. Well, when you start to talk about coronary arteries, they still start to, remember, they just don't stop at the kidneys. They're still going to go all the way through it. You're hemolysizing, right? You're putting your, the, the uh, blood in here. The body recognizes within 15 minutes, holy crap, what the hell is this blood coming in here? This is a foreign entity. Destroy it. It destroys and it starts to go towards the the uh, right atrium through the uh, tricuspid, right ventricle pops over through pulmonic into the, the lungs, right? Still makes it through that pulmonature, comes back, coronary arteries, all those type of things. So cardiac arrest, right? So this patient starts to, but what's the key thing on hemolytic? Holy crap, stop the blood. So the rule is, if you see a problem in the first 15 minutes, stop the blood, period, okay? So, so vital signs, first 15 minutes, see something, I'm chills, fever, okay, what else you got, right? Flank pain, oh, hemolytics, stop, pay, change of patient condition, okay. All right, so stay there. There's some changes with blood transfusions, okay? And these changes are where you used to prime with normal saline and then you hang the blood, right? But now they say that you, you just hang the blood and you keep normal saline on the side in case you need it, okay? That's a little bit gray. It's a little bit all over the place. However, um, it's been out there long enough. However, you still see old school nurses still priming with normal saline. So the principle is, is that <clears throat> we're going to talk specifically about this process, but what I want you to do is isolate hemolytic first. Okay. So if you understand the concept, lysis, kidneys, cardiac arrest. Okay, good. All right. So we got that. So let's go to non-hemolytic. All right. All right. So Sensitivity to the donor blood plasma platelets. Okay, so it's non-hemolytic. Still a problem. Okay, so let's retake this. You're giving the blood. Okay. Well, the problem is sensitivity. So think of histamine, mild um, histamine response in the body. It recognizes the blood as there's, there's something wrong here, but it's not lysising them, okay? It's not doing that. So they're still going to have that histamine response, fever, chills, everything like that, right? But they get these kind of muscle pains, cramps, those type of things start to go on, right? So now in a non-hemolytic situation, so what's the difference here? There's no difference. 
less than 15 minutes, muscle cramps, headache, fever chills, we already know is already a problem. The, the greatest risk about this is respiratory arrest. All right. Now, that's nuts to know if you're doing a Saunders book. That's nuts to know if you're doing a Davis book. You're going to see them splitting hairs about these different contents. NCLEX is going to give you less than 15 minutes patient change of condition. What do you do? Well, am I going to let it run? No, stop it. <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a problem. It's less than 15 minutes. They're looking like this. There's a problem. Stop the, stop the blood. Normal saline, so normal saline is always the treatment. Give normal saline, why? Well, think about this. If you have hemolysis, and just to even think about hemolytic in here, so it's always normal saline. We want, think of a rhabdo patient. Flood them up. Let's dissipate some of this activity that's going on and create perfusion. And so we normal saline that. Okay, so the rule is normal saline gets hung with it. It doesn't get primed with it. Never anything else. No lactated ringers, no dextrose, nothing. Normal saline only. If you're doing questions, you're going to see normal saline. Or the patient's going to get lactated ringers with blood. No, you don't do that. All right. So what do you think? Epinephrine? I mean, you'll never get to this stage. Right? Because NCLEX is never going to have an anticipated order and stuff like that. But just think about this. It's kind of like anaphylaxis. Epi, epi for dead people. You have a situation that if you kept this blood running, they're going to die. Epi, dead people. So that's priority action. Now, if you're doing questions, they'll be splitting hairs about this principle. But NCLEX is not going to make you do that because the thing is, is that most likely is that you're going to give blood and you're going to see that there's a problem and you just don't be like, oh yeah, here's some Benadryl, you're good to go, you know, that type of sense. Because we're going to talk about those next because when do they show up? Because you're getting questions right now if you've been doing blood questions about that principle of giving Benadryl, giving Lasix, and giving a Tylenol. When you send it to the lab, when you don't send it to the lab. All right, so let's go to the next one right now. We're going to go to um, the next uh, 15 minutes with no extra time in it. So that's um, IgA incompatibility, antigen versus antibodies. So anaphylaxis, right? So it's an acute response. Not a, not a so think of a, uh, a bee sting. A bee sting is an anaphylaxis response, right? The antibodies and the venom of what's going on in the body, anaphylaxis. So bees, anaphylaxis, blood, IgG, IgM incompatibility. So basically you have these antibodies in your body. They recognize it. They're like, holy crap, whoosh, acute distress. Right? So think of anaphylaxis when you think it's strider. Right? So stay with that concept. It's always the other way with anaphylaxis. And everybody in this class should know anaphylaxis is an airway problem. Right? It's not a blood pressure, all these things. Even though those things can be affected, it is airway. Right? That's where epinephrine and all these type of things come in. Okay, so stay with airway. In anaphylaxis, we have wheezes. Okay? So prior to giving blood, you do assessment of lung sounds because now you've given blood and they have wheezes, or well, the patient's complaining of wheezes, okay? So now all of a sudden, your first question is, here's a scenario. The patient's receiving blood in the first 15 minutes, complains of wheezes, acute, okay? Not, not an albuterol. This is an acute situation. Stop it. Stop the blood. Think normal saline. Think about calling the doctor, get vital signs, then you treat symptoms, okay? So the first thing is to stop it, right? Validate what they're saying to you, right? So that's, and it's all based on time, because that first 15 minutes is when it really is an issue. Okay, 
So let's move forward to the next thing. So as you can see here, so restlessness, uticaria, wheezes, shock is a late sign, cardiac arrest. Okay. So if if Saunders is see that's Saunders the splitting here is about like do you know the whole content? Most likely is is that you look for similar similarities between the two. You know, fever and chill shows up here, shows up here, right? Chill shows up here, over here. Muscle aches, uh, uticaria, okay? So you have uticaria, and then you have itching, okay? So you start to see these similarities between these two things. But the principle is, is that it's all about time and when it is, okay? Um, so... So do you see why 15 minutes is the most important at this stage? And that's the time frame. So your question has to be presented with giving you a time frame of when you're doing this. Once you have that, then you answer the question, right? So let's go into the next situation, right? So let's give it some more time, all right? So the way I handle this is, is generally I'll take, let's take the um, after transfusion question, okay? So let's start with that first. All right, so the patient is six hours after the transfusion. Well, what are you gonna do? Is it emergent? Is it acute? No, because it's six hours after. I can't get the blood out of them, right? They already received it. So what the hell do I do, right? So that's an important concept because you have two here that's greater than six hours. All the other ones, or less than 15 minutes. So that's it right here. You have less than 15 minutes, then post transfusions. Okay. What they won't give you is that 20 minutes into the transfusion question. Okay. What they'll give you is two hours into a transfusion. Right. So right there, it's two hours. So it's not hemolytic, it's not acute, right? Because they've been receiving for two hours. So on a post-transfusion question, let's talk about bacterial first. They've already received the blood, six hours, okay? Up to six hours, they're gonna get a bacterial uh, symptomology. So the patient, one hour after transfusion, complaining of a fever and headache and chills. What's priority action? Well, assess the patient. Know that it's a bacterial infection, right? So fever, headache, and chills requires further assessment. So vital signs, temperature, like what can I do? The blood's already gone, or the blood needs to be sent if the blood is available send it to the lab, culture sensitivity. You have a bacterial febrile situation, so blood cultures right away, okay? Patient post-transfusion, five hours. No, post-transfusion an hour ago, two hours ago, okay? And complaining of a headache and chills and blood pressures X, Y, Z. Well, this is post-transfusion question, so it's either going to be bacterial or allergic. Well, bacteria is more acute than mild allergic, right? Why? Sepsis. That's all this is. So you do blood cultures of the patient. You notify the doctor. Okay. Um, so always, always do blood cultures or and urine cultures as well. So blood and urine. Okay, so how do I know it's bacterial? Time, that's it. It's based on time. Because the only other ones that kind of are similar to that, if you look at this, is hemolytics. These are the only ones that are similar to what you're seeing right here. You know, this hypotension transcribes over to this anaphylaxis, but it's based on time. See, there is some splitting of the hairs here, like it's 30 minutes. 
And that's the universal thing, is bacterial febrile reactions don't happen within the first 15 minutes. It's usually based on contamination of procedure, blood, uh, not wearing gloves, those type of things. Some sort of contamination happened in the IV solution or something like that. Um, vomiting or diarrhea, I mean, patient could have a headache, chills, and diarrhea, and you have blood, and then you have two hours into the transfusion, okay? All right. So this is different than a post-transfusion. Patient had complains of fevers, headache, right? Chills. Post-transfusion or two hours into the transfusion. That's not an allergic response. That's very specific of a fever. Is it acute? Okay, so let's talk about that. So this is a little bit different because we're two hours into the transfusion. Would you say, well, the blood's fine, we're just gonna keep on running it? If you, no, you stop it, right? Common sense, right? You're not gonna let it run, right? I'm just gonna throw some Tylenol at them. No, you would stop the blood two hours into it, right? Stop the blood, get blood cultures, Send the blood to the lab, notify a doctor. And what would you anticipate? Antibiotics, Tylenol, or something like that. Okay, so that's it. So two hours into a transfusion, three hours into a transfusion, those are the symptomologies. It's blood cultures, send blood to the lab, notify the doctor. Do you need an order for it? No, just send them to get cultures and sensitivity. Because we've learned that in previous questions that you can just do cultures and sensitivity. Okay? Doctor needs to be notified. All right. Let's take the next one. Mild allergic. Okay. Once again, 15 minutes to 24 hours. Once again, you're greater than six. Okay. So patient received blood last night. They should receive 12 hours ago. Bacterial, not bacterial, allergic, mild allergic. Complaining of facial flushing, urticaria, itching. Well, what are you going to do? It's 12 hours ago. The patient already received the blood. Okay? So there's nothing you can do about it, but it isn't doing blood cultures because those are not symptoms of, of infection. That's a mild allergic. It's not anaphylaxis. You know, so what do you think? Benadryl, corticosteroid. What's an anticipated order? Benadryl, you know, steroids. That's it, you know? Time is everything with this, and that's the big difference between the two. It's not, holy crap, this is what's going on, this, that, and the other thing. See where the time is. Stop there and say, okay, based on what I'm seeing, fever chills, throw that out. Okay, low back, okay, well, that I'm stopping the blood no matter what. If it's less than 15 minutes. If it is greater than 15 minutes, is the blood still running? Now, I'm more likely to stop on a septic patient than an allergic, mild allergic patient, right? So I'm more likely to get Benadryl than... Um, but I might get, do this first, hold blood, assess for, you know, sepsis, prepare Tylenol, whatever, you know, and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's a little bit like, this is our first run through today. So the principle behind this, and we'll talk about more tomorrow as far as um, the concepts, because it's all about timing. Once you know the time, now what you want to do is as you're doing questions, Stop paying attention to that piece because what they're going to start to do is give you, give you uh, scenarios, but they have to give you a recipe. They have to give you, here you are in the room at this time giving it. They're not going to give you randomly patients uh, receiving blood, you know, and complains of X, Y, Z because, well, it depends. It could be all these reasons, right? So, and if it is all those reasons, Stop it. 
because I can't make a decision because it's given me all these reasons. It didn't give me any time. So I'm going to say it's less than 15 minutes. I'm going to stop the blood. And that's it because the patient's presenting abnormally and I don't, that's abnormal to what's going on. So I stop the blood. All right. Let's take a quick break and come right back. All right, so blood. Now, the problem with blood is, is like I said, is the confusion that you have with questions and, you know, what's right, what's wrong, and because sometimes you're doing this, sometimes you're doing that. Those are bad questions. I mean, it's just, you know, their focus on what they're doing, and that's why those NCLEX books and those prep books are very difficult to pin down. What do I need to know, you know? So and that's kind of where... Everything tends to contradict it, itself, you know, and it becomes like, you know, one minute you're doing this and one minute you're doing that. So, you know, when I approach this topic, it's, it's, it's dissecting that piece. And I see what, like I said, you guys see. So it becomes very complicated in the process. So with that, you have to cut, take away what is most likely, you know, if they're to present something like this, you know, um, What's most likely? Well, is time, and it comes down to that time piece. It's like when are we? When's this blood happening? You know, when is that actually being transfused, and where um, am I in this scenario? Once you know that, then you can go to the next step. You know, but you know, so so the first rule is: is it did it just start? Is it less than fifteen minutes? Well, then it's going to be generally acute. Generally, if you have something going wrong with that patient in the first 15 minutes, you're not just going to say, oh, let's see what happens, you know, because it's not 30 minutes, it's not an hour, let's just keep it running and let's see. No, assess your patient. Stop, stop whatever it is going on. The books, on the other hand, are going to be splitting these hairs that they want you to figure this out or figure this out. So it doesn't make it, um, doesn't make it uh, absolute. So policy drives a lot of this stuff too. So, you know, if the, the, the NCLEX doesn't want you to say, well, you know, let it run. You know, what if you have a hematologist or something like that? It's like, no, this is what the policy is. So you stop it if you think there's something wrong. It always comes down to safety. So, and that's what you want to say. Is it safe for me to allow this to keep running? And the rule is no. If there's something wrong, stop it. It's not safe. So therefore, you don't do it. But when you're looking at a Saunders book or a U World question or a Davis book or whatever books you're looking at, they're going to split that here because of whatever their thought process is to approach this content. And cuts will not split hairs like that because most important is that you save the patient that might be having a potential problem. So if you didn't know what was going on, is it most is it is it more effective to allow it to keep happening or to stop it? When you have an acute situation like giving blood, it's acute, so stop it. And that's the priority action. So now, as far as splitting hairs, whether it's going to be Tylenol or you send it to, to the, the, uh, the lab or different things like that, well, that's Saunders questions, right? So is, it, is the lab universal, right? Is the hospital universal? Do, do they do that? You know, like I've worked at hospitals on contracts. You know, that, you know, it's like, oh, patient died, right? Well, let's get a tech to, to, to bring them down to the morgue. No, no, it's just you and I. Okay, you go, you know, and you bring them down, right? So, I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean it's so, so it's not universal. So then you have to say, okay, well, when we're approaching this content, what's the most important? Time is the most important with this. So, so let's go back. We'll just go back a little bit. So, um, Let's see what we got. Uh, is it 15, 15, then hourly? Okay, so the, the vital signs are given, you do it before, they're stable. They're considered stable, and it's within the scope of a UAP to do vital signs before. I've seen 15 minutes before, 15 minutes after as a quantifiable thing. I think it's a little gray, but I've seen questions where they delegate, where you can delegate vital signs prior to and after. Now, if the patient had a post-bacterial 
would you have the, the UAP do it or you? You would do it. You wouldn't let the UAP do it. That means it's change of patient condition, okay? Second question. If the patient has, it, you're in the middle of it, well, in the first 15 minutes, the nurse does those vital signs, okay? What about the hour? Well, tech could do that because the problems have already happened, right? Anything that's gonna kill the patient right now would have happened already. So it's a little gray when the UAP is. So generally it's usually before or after when those questions are asked, okay? Um, so then what's, what about the numbers? It's always the first 15 minutes, right? So 15 minutes, then a repeat 15 minutes, so now you're at 30 minutes, then you move towards hourly. The next hour will be 30 minutes later, then hour, then hour, okay? Because it goes back to that 30 minute rule with bacterial. So if you look at that sheet, it's bacterial's 30 minutes, and then you start to see it. But remember, bacterial and mild allergic, you know, if you had to pick one of them, bacterial is more acute because it is also called febrile, right? So if you did some books, they'll talk to it as, as febrile. That patient, you base it on the time, hour into transfusion. Okay, it's either gonna be bacterial or mild allergic. Two hours into it, bacterial, mild allergic. Three hours into it, bacterial, mild allergic. Transfusion just ended, bacterial, mild allergic, right? Up to six hours, seven hours, mild allergic. 10 hours, mild allergic, okay? And that's how it works. So then you, then you start to split the hairs, right? So the vital signs um, and the treatment start to split. So now you're gonna have, you're gonna give the transfusion and you might pre-medicate. Okay. Patient has a history of allergic, then you pre-medicate with Benadryl. Okay. NCLEX will probably stay away from that. Um, pre-medicate with Lasix, we see that. Okay. It's what we do, NCLEX will probably stay away from that. Okay. Um, more important is that you know you need to get blood cultures. Okay. Um, and knowing the difference, I think, between mild allergic and um, bac uh, bacteremia or febrile, right? Because they're very different, right? So hives, fevers are two different things. A headache, flushing is two different things. Uticaria, chills are two different things. Fever and itching, you know, those type of things, right? So itching is not bacterial. So just think of bacteria, sepsis, infection. All right. Um, so when I was talking about putting it in the correct order, they will not have you run through the vital science piece, right? Like 15 minutes then and then an hour and stuff like that. They'll have you run from consent, right? So the patient needs to get their uh, blood. You need to get in consent, right? You're gonna get uh, baseline vital signs. You know, vital signs are gonna be closer to the time of transfusion, right? So that's always important because that would make sense. The closer the vital signs are before the transfusion, it's better than after. So you do an IV, so you get the consent, get an IV in, right? So those are the biggest time consuming things. Then send to get the blood, do a set of vital signs, and then, you know, prime. So how do you prime? Prime with the blood. However, the questions that you're gonna see in line is you're gonna see them priming with normal saline. Okay, that's what we used to do. Doesn't mean we do that now, all right? Never ever lactated ringers. Um, questions that you see online, you're going to see people pre-medicating people, you know. They'll also have you giving giving medication. But generally, stop the, stop the blood first, then medicate, okay. So primal tubing, it's special tubing. It's not, not uh, regular IV tubing. It's special tubing. And then, um, then you stay with the patient in the first 15 minutes, okay. 
They split the hairs about 60, 30 minutes, and for the first 15 minutes is when you definitely stay. And once you stay, you're looking for those problems. Okay. Now, the other thing is, is that, you know, then you have when you're taking care of the patient, you know, one hour into it, two hours into it. What's 15 minutes? You know, see seats? 50. 50 cc's or 15 minutes is generally the first uh, rule of thumb. All right, so you take vitals as you admit or do you still wait 15? And then you do vital signs um, just before and then 15 minutes once you start. Well, we start fusing first to right. Yeah. Yep, high followers, yep, normal saline, says ABCs, notified doctor, return blood. Yeah, because what can the nurse do right now? Stop the problem, right? Stop it, stop the blood, then do the rest. Wake up, Ashley. All right. Um, same bag of blood for duration of four hours, yep. Max four hours, yes. And you, you switch out tubing every two to two to three units, that's gray, okay? Um, because what if it was incompatible, right? And it had a bacteria, and then you're flipping in. So that policy seems a little bit gray for me. Um, what else? Multiple transfusions, citrate toxicity, hypocalcemia, hypomagnesia, give them calcium gluconate, and then um, multiple transfusions, they get very cold, right? So they can get hypothermia. Um, so that's why they warm up blood and everything like that. All right, so let's move into the next part of um, this stuff. Um, so CHF, perfect scenario, right? I mean, you're told they have CHF. So hence, you assess vital signs, you assess lung sounds. You assess lung sounds anyways because how do you know they had wheezes, right, in the anaphylaxis? Um, even autologous a reaction is likely auto, yeah, so an autologous reaction, the most likely is uh, bacteremia, vibra, contamination of that blood. So somewhere along the lines, it was contaminated. Um, all right. All right, last one, last part of this we're gonna talk about is gonna be CHF. Well, I mean, CHF is, that's a give me. Thank you for that. You know what I mean? Telling you they have CHF, right? I mean, that's fluid overload, right? So patient CHF has crackles. I mean, you know, I mean, if it has CHF and you have crackles, you slow down the blood, period. Okay? They still need to get the blood, but there's nothing acute. You have an expected finding of a patient with CHF. You know, most likely it's because of the fluid overload. It's just going in too fast. Um, that's why you assess the lungs first. Uh, will you stop the transfusion? Well, most likely slow it first. Then, you know, if the patient doesn't get better, so you reassess the patient, right? So slow, reassess. But I don't think they would go into a, a reassessment and then stop it, right? So it's usually CHF, slow it down, and then... Uh, all right, some patients are medicated with Benadryl and diuretics based on patient history. Patient has an ejection fraction of 20%, you know, rece anticipating receiving blood. What's, a, what's an anticipated order? You know, those type of things, Lasix, right? Not Benadryl, that type of thing. Patient has a mild allergic. What's an anticipated order? Benadryl, you know. Uh, so what's the treatment? High follows always. Flush normal saline. Keep vein open, KVL, right? Assess ABCs, level of consciousness, what's the patient look like, so notify the doctor. So there's all those things that you do in the meantime, and then call the doctor. Then you return the blood to the blood bank because if it's an allergic reaction, hemolytic or something like that, you always return it to there. The only time you do blood cultures is generally bacteremia, febrile. Um, Give them oxygen, yeah, especially if they're 
hemolytic or something like that. All right. So, where are we at? All right. So, um, hold on. all right. Let's look at some blood orders here. All right. So, um, consent, right? So, we've already talked about that. Blood products can be obtained prior to initiation, right? So time, right? So time is is important, right? Four hours, right, to administer. Get some baseline, right? So baseline, we said the baseline can be done by a UAP, 15 minutes before, 15 minutes after. Um, but basically, if you haven't given the transfusion, then what's, that's within the scope. I mean, patients admitted with CHF, you do admission vitals, right? But... I mean, the patient's going to go down to a uh, uh, CAT scan. You can get a UAP to go do those vital signs. All right, so uh, oxygen, no kidding, respirations. 15 minutes post-initiation, in right? So then the, this, this order says every 60 minutes after until one hour post-completion. So why out one hour post-completion? Because of bacteremia and mild allergic. Right, because we said that in the first 15 minutes, but we're still monitoring for that, you know, because bacteremia is more of an acute situation than mild allergic. So we just do another set after one hour. Pre-transfusion, CBC, that makes sense. So we know now one unit increases one hemoglobin. Okay, so if the person had 12 uh, hemoglobin, they would have a 13 general. That's a general rule. Um, APTT, so that's coags in case you wanted to do that, bleeding, type and screen, fibrinogen, we'll talk about that with Claude and Cascade today, and then uh, calcium and mag, that makes sense, right, because of citrate toxicity, right, because why else wouldn't you check it, right, because if the patient can be hypocalcemic, then I'd want to know that. Uh, CBC went back up, okay, so it was next day, um, okay, consider transfusion reaction. Okay, so 4,000, we should know that. That's an old school. Um, and we talked about that, right? So for bacteremia, febrile, diphenhydramine, right? Uh, transfusion products, okay, those are the H&H, &H, transfuse, okay. So if transmit fusion reaction allergic, greater than temperature, 38C, right? So that's a Celsius. Um, temperature rise of one degree, right? Um... You to carry a rigors, right? Yeah, that's old school. Uh, notify a doctor, stop transfusion, notify a blood bank, reaction bacteria, blood sample, transfusion, urine, cultures, Tylenol, and diphenhydramine. So, I mean, it's called the same stuff, right? So, it's exactly what we're talking about. Um, and I said the rest of the stuff is just kind of policy. And then when you're placed into uh, the question on a blood transfusion. All right, so any questions about that right now? Your goal is to pretty much look at questions as you start to do these blood transfusion questions.